My name is Roddy Kiley. I'm the founder of Binary Dawn Interactive 2012 Incorporated based in St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Um, I guess that makes me both the founder, the director, and the president. Um, but really my background is software development and I consider myself, I guess you'd say, a software craftsman. Um, so really my function is to wear many hats. Um, as as a, an entrepreneur who runs a small micro studio, um, pretty much anything from accounting, website maintenance, infrastructure maintenance, business plans, um, creating software, you know, working a business deal. So pretty much if it takes, if it's needed to run a company, then in a lot of cases I need to do it. Binary Don was a, was a name that I came up with back in, I think it was about 2001, 2002 time frame to kind of give a voice to my developer alter ego, my game developer alter ego in particular. Um, in 2008, some, some friends of mine who were really big on the whole Mac scene said, you know, hey, this, this App Store thing, this might actually go somewhere. And obviously, I mean, as you can tell by today, that he was clearly, clearly another Nostradamus in the making. So um, basically, uh, I took all my existing game development work and poured it into uh, the mobile space. So really, you know, we started that in 2008 and developed a lot of technology. And following in 2009, we formally incorporated uh, at that point in time as Binary Don Interactive Incorporated. So the company that I run today uh, is a subsequent follow-up company to that and the 2012 means that we just actually kind of are relaunching the company uh, just actually at the beginning of this year. Okay, what's the philosophy, what's the concept, what distinguish the company? Uh, I think we try to make inventive products, you know, with a lot of integrity and we very much care about the, uh, the quality of our work you know, certainly, you know, with 578,000 apps in the App Store as of, you know, just very recently, certainly the quality range that's available there is, is you know, very, very broad to say the least. Um, we've always prided ourselves in being very particular about, you know, the products that we put out and being proud to say that, hey, we created this. And, you know, even if, even if it's a case where, you know, the market may not, may not think it's the next Angry Birds, uh, we can at least feel proud that, that this is something we created and put out there. Can you talk to me a little more about your products, your audience? Okay, so um, basically, as I said, you know, Binary Don Interactive 2012 Incorporated is, is a follow-up. So the products that we originally created, um, we, we, we put out three products in the App Store. Uh, the first one in 2009 was uh, called Through to IOTA, which by the name I'm sure you're not going to actually uh, understand very much of what it's all about, which of course is, is a business and marketing problem in and of itself. But essentially, IOTA is uh, 10 in Greek, and the goal was to get through 10 levels, essentially. It was a very simple game, um, you know, our first effort. Uh, it was kind of a, a slightly serious curling slash pool, sort of physically simulated kind of game. Just like, you know, curling or pool, I mean, it takes some practice. And of course, you know, if the mobile market these days, uh, a, lot of, a lot of it's about instant gratification. You know, you're, you're in a taxi, you're at a bus stop, you're in line. You want to pull it out, you want to play something really quick, just kind of get your mind off what you're doing, have some fun, maybe a laugh, and move on. So, so our, original, um, our original product through to IOTA wasn't a great market hit. But, like I said, it was something we were proud of. It was, a, it was a good product, and we did actually have some people who really, really loved it, even though it was very hard and very challenging, and played it multiple times over. Um, so, from that experience, we learned that, you know, maybe we should make something that can reach a, ver a broader audience. And from that effort um, came Word Us 2, which was a word guessing game, um, kind of similar maybe to um, the old game show called Lingo, or also slightly to the, uh, oh, I can't remember the, the board game now. It'll come to me later. So basically, it's a very simple word game, game where you have to guess the word, and you're, you're given the first letter, and then basically you kind of have to guess from there. So, you know, we put a lot of effort into that, and, and you know, over time, we had uh, put it in the catalog with Moms with Apps, their catalog, and we, we put it down even to three letters so that you could you know, reach even a younger audience. So, so when we launched that one in uh, November of uh, 2010, um, essentially it became the uh, What's Hot Word Game in Canada for about three months. And it was also the new and noteworthy word game in Canada for about three months. And as well, it was nominated for uh, best word game ever in the word game category for 148apps.com and I guess somewhat unsurprisingly we were beaten by Scrabble. 
So, you know, overall I'd have to say that the, the product definitely from our perspective was a great success and something we're proud of. But from that we, uh, you know, again, you know, technical success and financial success are often two different things. So we decided to, you know, expand our boundaries a little bit. And so we went back to an early concept that we had called Giggle Water. Now, that name doesn't mean much to people these days, but Giggle Water was originally the term that was used for alcohol during Prohibition. So Giggle Water was all about drinking in the 1920s. So basically, it was an accelerometer-based game where your job was to keep your little character with drinks in his hand and make sure that he didn't go dry. And if he went dry, you were in trouble. So essentially, it was... It wasn't a very deep gameplay experience. It was more of a tilt toy, something you'd haul out at a party, show off to your friends, have a laugh, put it away. You know, so we were trying to bridge that gap a little bit of, you know, ease of use and accessibility. So, so those were the products that we've had out in the App Store. And currently at the moment, we're attempting to revitalize the Wordus franchise. And basically, you know, if you look at the business models in the mobile segment right now, things have gone from very much premium titles to very much freemium titles. So we're basically revitalizing that and relaunching that as a, as a freemium title now. So that should happen, you know, relatively soon. So that's kind of where we are product-wise right now. So talking about the mobile space, um, you know, in the beginning the media had a lot of darling stories like iShoot and Trism where, you know, single, single man development shops, you know, made it, made an app and overnight they made, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars. So Certainly in the beginning there was a lot of thought of, hey, we're just going to, you know, throw something out there and it's going to be a great success and isn't this going to be wonderful? But the reality obviously is much different and today, you know, with 578,000 apps in the store and about 1,000 new apps coming out every day, of which 15% are games, you know, it's very challenging to, uh, to basically stand out in, in that kind of crowded marketplace. So certainly in our case, uh, looking at our business model and looking at our future directions, um, we're looking not just in the mobile space, but we're looking outside the mobile space to to be able to get closer to our customers and be able to reach a broader audience, whether that's, you know, online or maybe desktop or, may, or maybe even um, supporting developers in some cases using our internal tools to help generate revenue streams. So, so from a technical perspective, a lot of technical problems have been solved in the mobile space. I mean, the number of tools and technologies now that are available for mobile developers are huge in comparison to what they were, say, in 2008 for, for the iPhone, for example. Um, but now I think a lot of indie developers are really struggling with, with the business model problem more so than the technical. Okay. What are the next steps in the future for your studio? Um, for us, you know, I mean, right now we're, we're in a transitionary period where we're kind of reflecting upon what we've done so far and looking at our IP and seeing how to basically revitalize that for the future, whether it be, you know, better business models or extensions to, um, to, the, to the gameplay itself. So, you know, in the short term, we're looking at revitalization. Um, in the longer term, I think you'll see that we're branching out somewhat from our mobile roots and, and really just becoming a game development studio, um, either whether that's online or whether that's des desktop and PC. Uh, that remains a little bit to be seen. Okay, and uh, the last one, what, according to you, is the future for video games? Oh wow, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a pretty broad question right there. I mean, in my case, you know, I started playing video games on a VIC-20 like a long, long time ago and like spent many years playing on a Commodore 64, so computer games were really kind of, you know, I guess the medium that I grew up with. And if I look today at the computer game industry and the video game industry in a broader context, um, you know, then compared to now, I mean, you know, you look at it now and the video game business makes, you know, more money than Hollywood, right? So really, I think, you know, if, if movies, if radio and then movies were, were the medium of, you know, the 20th century, then I really think video games will be the medium of the 21st century. I think there's no doubt. I mean, all the signs are there. I mean, you know, you look at big hits like Angry Birds and the different types of people that play that game and you look at things like Zynga's Farmville where, you know, I read a report one day that one of the top players was a 54-year-old grandmother who was, you know, very into getting all her family to help her out. This was like the big family thing. She was kind of like the matriarch and she was kind of pulling all the strings of all the grandchildren and stuff to help her out on Facebook. So, I mean, 
if you look at that kind of story compared to, you know, me, a young little guy playing on VIC-20, it's a night and day difference, and it just shows you how far we've come in a very short period of time as an industry. And I think that's really only going to continue because now we're having the people who started out like me as parents, and they're bringing up their children playing video games. And I mean, there's a broad selection out there, so you can have your children playing the right video games, whatever you perceive them to be, you know, to teach them the right lessons. It's not all about violence and gore anymore. Or and it's not all about, you know, young teenage boys in a room playing by themselves, you know. I mean, multiplayer gaming, family gaming, active physical gaming with the Wii. I mean, heck, it's even used for bowling in, in old age homes. So, I mean, I think we're going to see that continue and grow even more.